2016 Board of Directors meeting to order. Thanks everybody for braving the snow to be here. And we will begin with the Pledge of Allegiance. Connie, if you'd call the roll. Yes. Eva Henry. Here. Bill Holland. Nancy Sharp. Elise Jones. Here. David Beacom. Here. Tim Mock. Chrissy Fanganello. Here. And Robin Knich. Here. Roger Partridge. Here. Gail Watson. Don Rozier. Libby Zabo. Bob Pfeiffer. I know he's here. Bob Roth. Larry Vidham, David Spellman, Aaron Brockett, Here. Ann Justin, Here. Lynn Baca, Rex Bell, George Teal, Paul Donahue, oh, I guess I should say that one, uh, Doris Trular, Carrie Penaloza, Ron Engels, Catherine Heider, Laura Christman, Alex Brown, Richard Champion, Gail Christie, Rick Teeter, Here. Debbie Nasta, Steve Conklin, Here. Joe Jefferson, Steve Yates, Jeff Deacon, Mark Gruber, Daniel Dick. Here. Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey. Here. Scott Norquist. Here. Saoirse Caresgrave. Here. <laughs> Ron Rakowski, TJ Gordon, Mike Hillman, Brad Weasley, Here. Shakti. Here. Jerry Bean, Phil Cernanek. Jackie Malay, Here. Joan Peck, uh, Ashley Stolzman, Here. Connie Sullivan, Dan Greenberg, Colleen Whitlow, Joyce Palazuski, Deborah Jerome, Sean Foray, Chris Larson, Kyle Mollica, John Dyack, Here. Sally Daigle, Gary Howard, Rita Dozal, Here. Adam Metkowski, Eric, Eric Montoya, Mon Here. Eric Montoya. Herb Atchison, yes. Joyce J, Adam Zarin, yes. Deborah Perkins Smith, Bill Van Meter. Here. And we do have a quorum. Thank you, Connie. And um, we take the opportunity to announce um, a new alternate. Trustee Mark Lasis is the new alternate for the Town of Superior. I don't think he's here tonight, but we appreciate him signing up for duty and look forward to meeting with him. Um, I would consider a motion to approve the agenda. Motion and motion and a second on the table. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The motion carries. And uh, report of the chair. Um, I mainly um, will report on the RTC me uh, meeting yesterday, which um, the uh, RTC unanimously approved the two action items we have on our agenda for tonight which were the amendments to the uh, TIP and a discussion of the air quality conformity modeling for um, the RTP. And they also heard uh, presentations on the annual listing of federally obligated permits and the fatality uh, report that we had already um, heard about and had a great discussion about that. I think that's all I have. Let me turn it over to Doug to see if he has more. Great. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I do have a number of items. Uh, first, just a reminder of uh, the members of both the Finance and Budget Committee and the Performance and Engagement Committee that we will be meeting directly after this meeting. Um, the Finance and Budget will be meeting in this room, and the Performance and Engagement will be meeting in Monarch. So it will start at 6 o'clock or immediately following the uh, proceedings of this, this, uh, of, of this board. And Connie just whispered, you will be re receiving dinner. How about that? Just, just the members of those committees. <laughs> no staff. <laughs> well, staff too. <laughs> we can eat. Um, Dr. Cox's staff served on the planning committee for the first annual planning partners conference hosted by Adams County uh, last week. Um, there's over 100 individuals representing dozens of organizations registered for the event. The, conf the conference focused on building collaboration and sharing success approaches on numerous issues including planning for economic development around DIA, innovative efforts to engage stakeholders 
in planning efforts and opportunities for local partners to engage Dr. Cog with key 2017 initiatives. And we would really like to thank Adams County and, and their staff and the communities uh, within Adams County for, uh, for um, the energy and effort for pulling this off. It was, it was no small feat. Uh, but I think it was, went really well, and I think the expectation is that this, this is one of, of many to, to follow. So thank you very much. You have at your desk this evening um, three different handouts. Um, the first I'll mention is the uh, idea exchange. Um, and you all should have received an invitation for this, but uh, just as a reminder, um, I'd like to encourage you to attend, if at all possible, the December 13th idea exchange. The topic is preserving affordable and attain attainable housing in our region. Um, particularly, you know, in the, in the red-hot market that we do have. Um, yeah, speakers at the Idea Exchange will share the latest data and information on existing challenges and tools, including a regional database designed to help preserve existing affordable units. So please, if you're, if you're able, uh, attend, that, uh, attend that event. Um, at that event, we also will feature uh, innovative, innovative housing initiatives from two of our members of the cities of Aurora and the city of Lakewood. Um, the second is a save the date for our 2017 award celebration. Uh, the date is April 16th and it will be held at the Sheridan Denver Downtown Hotel. So, uh, what did I say? 26th of, of April. Um, thank you very much. And uh, so we'll look forward. We'll have, you'll get more information as we uh, get closer to that event. But, uh, but please mark that on your calendars to make sure that everybody can attend. I think last year was a, was a fabulous event. And um, associated with, with that award celebration, um, we also encourage you, as we mentioned last month, we opened up the, the nominations for both the uh, John V. Christensen Memorial Award and the Metro Vision Awards. Um, you, can, you can nominate whomever you would like, whoever you see fit on our website. Um, so I would encourage you to do that. The nominations are open until January 31st, so, so please do. Uh, oh, I mentioned this last month, but I'll mention it again. Um, the Dr. Cog Open House uh, is scheduled for uh, February 1st, and again, it's that, that event where, you know, we try to demystify the, uh, what, what is the seventh floor. And uh, so we would strongly encourage you to attend that and meet some of our staff that you don't see on, on a monthly basis and, uh, well, quite frankly, the people that are really doing the work. Who am I kidding? Um, I think that's it. And lastly, you know, in, in, uh, in, in case I don't get an opportunity, um, I would really like to wish everybody a joyous holiday season and a very prosperous new year. So with that, Madam Chair, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Doug. So uh, now is the opportunity for members of the public to speak to us for three minutes. Do we have any takers? Seeing no takers, we'll continue on on our agenda. And that brings us to our consent agenda, which are the minutes of uh, our last meeting and our state legislative policy statement. I'd consider a motion. We have a motion and a second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The motion carries. We are flying. All right. That brings us to our first action item, which is a discussion of amendments to the 2016-21 TIP. Todd, I believe you're yes, and doing this afternoon. one. So attachment C contains two amendments for your consideration this evening. Uh, the first is a new project sponsored by the city and county of Denver for the Denver Smart City Program. Uh, Denver applied for and received uh, a federal grant of $6 million, uh, along with being matched by $6 million in local funds uh, through the FAST Act uh, under a new program um, called the Advanced Transportation and Congestion Management Technologies Deployment Program. Uh, and this will fund new transportation technologies that will help reduce congestion uh, and safety within the area. Uh, the second project is a scope revision for the North Metro Rail 112th Avenue corridor improvements um, sponsored by this uh, city of North Glen. Uh, this scope adjustment will, instead of solely uh, building a multi-use trail, uh, will, include, uh, will now include improvements to the intersection at 112th and York and 112th and Fox Run Parkway. Uh, in addition to building a small section of trail. Uh, the, the longer multi-use trail included within the original scope was built with local funds. 
Uh, since this was a second commitment in principle project, uh, all corridor partners did have to agree and they, they did so via email to Dr. Cog. Um, so with that, I will uh, take any questions you may have, but the action before you would be to approve these amendments uh, to the 1621 tip. Any questions? Director Shenanik. Yes, real quick, the uh, six million local, uh, understand it comes locally, but what are the sources for that? I am exa I'm not exactly unaware besides being in local funds. We, we do have uh, Chrissy Fagenel, who's more than capable of answering that question. They're uh, local city of Denver funds uh, coming out of our discretionary capital improvement program. Very nice. Thank you. Additional questions? If I'll make a motion to approve the uh, TIP amendment. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Then I'll call the question. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The motion carries unanimously. Moving on to our second and last action item is approval of the 2040 MetroVision RTP fiscally constrained roadway capacity projects and transit networks to be modeled for air quality conformity. Wow. <laughs> Take it away, Jacob. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. It's a mouthful. Um, so we are preparing our new 2040 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. This is our official long-range transportation plan. And every time that we either prepare a new transportation plan or make amendments to our plan, we do transportation air quality conformity modeling. And that's really what this item is about. Um, we adopted what we call our fiscally constrained regional transportation plan back in 2015. And since that time, we have made uh, a few amendments to the plan. We also opened up one more amendment cycle uh, this last summer and fall and got a couple minor amendments, you know, minor modifications to projects that are already in the plan. So we put all of that work together um, into a network of uh, Region, what we call regionally significant, which are the big ticket capacity projects, both big you know, roadway capacity projects, uh, interchanges, uh, rapid transit projects, fast tracks. These are, the, these are the projects that we model. We model specifically the networks in our, in our traffic model containing these projects that comprise our 2040 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. We do that with our uh, travel demand model, our multimodal transportation model, and then we do air quality conformity modeling. So specifically what we're asking for in this item is your approval of those uh, networks containing uh, those regionally significant uh, roadway capacity and rapid transit networks to model so we can go forward with completing our 2040 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. And with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions. Any questions? Director Shenanik. Uh, thank you. Uh, as you go through the modeling, uh, <coughs> You know, we see a lot of projects that come before us, uh, you know, that deal with uh, uh, those items that bubble up from the jurisdictions. Um, does the staff ever spend some time uh, playing around with the model to say, um, how do we um, maximize our impact on air quality given that we're in a nonconformance position? So I will say that in general terms, I maybe wouldn't quite characterize it that way. The model, the modeling work that we do is very complex, and I will be honest about that. Um, it, the, both the transportation model that we have in house, and then our air quality conformity modeling is done by uh, the state air pollution control division. Um, so there are a lot of a lot of factors and a lot of things that go into that. Um, but again, the projects in our model are the big ticket projects that uh, federal requirements require us to individually identify in the plan. There are other projects or categories of projects that won't show up in this process, things that come through the TIP, things like operations or maintenance, you know, those sorts of things are not what we're talking about. Uh, we're talking about the big roadway and rapid transit projects. So, uh, Director Stanek, I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, you were basically saying you don't play enough around enough with the modeling to figure out what our maximum impacts might be if we change some of our priorities. I mean, what we do in our modeling is we, we assume Sure. Um, we assume in our modeling, um, in, our, in our transportation model, we try and replicate, you know, we calibrate our model to existing conditions and then we kind of go forward from there. Um, if you're talking about, say, scenario planning, we certainly do that work sort of ongoing. 
Um, you know, some of you know we did a, a large scenario planning exercise uh, two to three years ago where, you know, I think we are doing what you're trying to say is, you know, if, if we're thinking of different futures, what would it take, you know, to get to those futures or address those futures? Um, in this particular process to meet federal requirements, we take the slate of the projects and the parameters that we have, but in our modeling, we do try to reflect the latest information, population employment, you know, those sorts of things, matching reality on the ground, and then projecting forward to 2040. Doug? I, I might just add on to that, and Jacob is correct. Um, I, you know, some of the scenario work that we have done before, I would anticipate that you'll see a lot more of that going forth for us. Um, to be quite honest with you and Frank, our, the model that we have, um, you know, was bleeding edge back in the day, you know, 10 years ago when it was first developed. And, um, you know, it was kind of the titanic of models, right? I mean, it's, it wasn't very easy to turn it around. It wasn't a speedboat by any means. Um, but I will say that um, the modeling team, what they have been doing over the past, past year or so has been recalibrating the model to, um, and speed up the process of it. So it's a, a model run that would take us basically a week to run, and now we can do it within, what, a day, Steve? Uh, a day. So it like, gives us a lot more, it may, it's more nimble and allows us to perform more exercises that we hope will be a, of benefit to, to the board going forth. And you can see a bunch of various scenarios if we, you know, were to, you know, do something here, something there. So stay tuned. Yeah, and right. I might just sort of supplement that by saying that um, all of this is an iterative process, and where we're at right now is sort of completing the plan that we have. As soon as we do that, we turn around right and we start the next plan. And as we start the next plan, we will be doing some of that scenario work in terms of, you know, whether it's land use, you know, sort of alternative futures, uh, whether it's, you know, financial resources, revenue resources. Uh, so over the next couple of years, we will be doing more of that exercise uh, for the next iteration of our long-range plan. Thank you. Other questions? there are no other questions, I would entertain a motion. What? I assume by so moved you mean that you approve um, We're asking the, those board projects to for air quality conformity? Yes, the networks containing the roadway capacity and rapid transit projects. So for modeling. For modeling. For modeling. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The motion carries unanimously. Moving on to informational briefings, we have a briefing on the Colorado or the CDOT's uh, development program. And just to introduce the introduction that Doug's going to um, give, this has been coming up at the stack a, a lot, and I thought it was important to bring to the Dr. Cog table's attention just so that we are involved in the process. This is basically, there's been a lot of lists that have been collected over the last few years for different purposes, be it 228 spending, trans bond, potential initiatives, um, CDOT funding, et cetera. And it's important, I think, for Dr. Cog to um, be able to see what's on the list for our region and to make sure that we're at the table for any prioritization of that list. Sorry, Great. thank Doug. you very much, Madam Chair. And I, I won't delay the proceedings. I'll, I'll simply turn it to Jeff Sudmeyer. We're happy to have Jeff here today from CDOT. Uh, intermodal branch manager? Multimodal. Oh, Close. multimodal. Close. All right. <laughs> thank you, Jeff, for being here. Um, and I'll, you just give me the knob when you want me to, to uh, turn a slide. All right, go, go right ahead. Well, uh, uh, good evening. Uh, thanks for the, uh, the opportunity to come and present to you. Um, I'm going to. Uh, uh, try to provide a little bit of an overview presentation of kind of what the development program is and why we're doing it uh, and then uh, happy to answer some uh, some questions um, we've in doing this we've worked very closely with uh, our, our CDOT regions and um, I may I know uh, Danny Herman from region one is in the audience so uh, when we if we get into talking about some of the specific projects in the region I may uh, I may uh, call on Danny to help me out with that as well but the regions really did a lot of the heavy lifting on on developing this so uh, I'd like to back up a little bit and, and kind of start by putting this in the context of the existing transportation planning process and so uh, um, we and you're all you're all probably very familiar with this but uh, just to kind of put it in the in context uh, Dr. Cog has a, uh, a regional transportation plan has a minimum 20-year uh, time horizon and it's really a, a policy and project-based plan so it it not only articulates policy, it also articulates specific 
uh, project priorities for uh, large regionally significant projects over the uh, the the twenty year time frame of the plan uh, that regional transportation plan kind of serves as, as somewhat of the foundation for your tip your your shorter term six year uh, program of projects uh, similarly at the uh, at the state level CDOT, we we have a twenty year statewide transportation plan that uh, pulls from not only the Dr. Cog plan, but uh, uh, 14 other regional transportation plans. The state plan, however, unlike the Dr. Cog plan, is a policy plan. It's not a project plan. So uh, it, it, it has not, at least in uh, the last several cycles, has not articulated uh, specific project priorities. Um, the development program is really a, a an additional, um, a, a new initiative that we're, we're introducing into kind of our traditional planning process to help fill the gap, um, particularly on the statewide side, between that, that long range 20 year view that's traditionally been focused more on policy than projects and our short term four year uh, statewide transportation improvement program. So, uh, so one of the, so, so why are we doing this? Um, one of the key reasons is that there's some significant limitations to uh, a policy-based statewide transportation plan. Um, we, while well, the, the Dr. Cog plan identifies specific projects, we have 14 other regional transportation plans around the state, and they're at varying levels of detail. So Dr. Cog has a very detailed articulation of project priorities. In other areas of the state, it's, it's much more general. It's, uh, these are our top corridors. Uh, these are the general types of needs on those corridors. And so to the, to the second bullet point on here, what we're trying to do with the development program is really kind of consolidate the priority information across the state that now exists in 15 different plans and on multiple different project lists. And we're also trying to fill in the gaps. So in some of those areas where uh, project priorities aren't articulated uh, as, as explicitly, um, the CDOT regions are working with our planning partners to really try to uh, uh, identify more specifically what those project needs are. Go ahead, Doug. Um, so, what exactly is this? Uh, again, it's 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 part of the transportation planning process. Um, we're not reinventing the wheel here. We're really building on the regional transportation plans, the existing uh, planning process, the existing priorities identified through that process, um, and we're identifying kind of our major investment needs across the state. And establishing some priorities around those needs with planning partner input. Uh, as the chair mentioned, um, this consolidates multiple project lists. Uh, we've we've historically had a had kind of been in a pattern where uh, we have new funding sources, new opportunities coming up, probably on the average of once a year. Uh, going back to 2012, we had the Recovery Act. We had a new CDOT program called Ramp. Uh, we had Senate Bill 228. We've had new discretionary grant programs like Tiger and Fastlane. Uh, our, our historic traditional response has been each time a new opportunity comes around, we kind of build a new list, we go out, what are the projects, and kind of create an a inventory of, of the things we might be considering, and then we, we identify from there. We were really trying with this to kind of consolidate those multiple, uh, often conflicting lists, and, and kind of establish a single uh, uh, foundation that we could use to support some of our project selection processes. Finally, this is a tool. It is not a. Um, it is not a federal requirement. It is not a uh, a stip um, or a tip, which is really more of a commitment of funding. Um, it is not a funding decision. It's really a tool to track, um, to better track our needs and to really support planning and project selection processes. That's really where the the decision making happens. Is the, is a project selection process. This is not a project selection process. It is, however, uh, a tool that we can use really uh, as a foundation for project selection processes. So to put a little bit of a finer point on what we're talking about here, and we, we tend to use the term development program somewhat interchangeably, but we're really talking about uh, a, two things here. One is what I'll call an inventory of major investments. And so that's kind of everything that's out there. Um, well, not everything, but I'll get to that in a moment. But <laughs> it's, it's an inventory of uh, most of the larger project priorities across the state. And we, we took those from, again, multiple project lists, from 15 regional transportation plans, from working with the planning partners in CDOT regions. 
And uh, that inventory resulted in about 130 major highway projects representing over $9 billion, I think it's closer to $9.5 billion, in, uh, in funding need. Um, this is a, a point where I'll, I'll emphasize that when, I, when I'm talking about 130 projects, $9 billion, we're talking about highway projects. So while the intent is for this to be uh, a multimodal program or plan, uh, we started with the highway side. And so the highway inventory and, and the second piece I'll talk about uh, are largely uh, complete. The same is not true for the transit side, for the bike ped side. We've started uh, developing on the transit component of the bike ped, of the, I'm sorry, of the development program. Uh, the bike ped, we, we really are just beginning. Um, so there's the broader inventory and then within that inventory there's what we're calling our 10-year development program plan. And, uh, and so what that is, is it's really a, a higher priority subset. So nine, nine and a half billion dollars is uh, such a, a, um, a huge level of need that, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to kind of wrap your, your hands around. It's hard to know where to start. So we wanted to identify within that really what are the projects or phases of projects that uh, would be a higher priority or at a, a, um, a, a higher stage of re state of readiness uh, over the next 10 years. And what that looks like is about 70 of those projects or, or phases of projects that represent about two and a half billion dollars. And to, uh, to get there, uh, we really relied on uh, a combination of regional transportation plans, the existing planning process, and stakeholder input. So in areas like uh, Dr. Cog, where you have a regional transportation plan that has very clearly articulated project priorities, uh, what you will see here in both the inventory and the smaller tenure development program plan is more of a reflection of what's already articulated in your regional transportation plan, um, albeit perhaps with some uh, further refinement, updating of data, et cetera, um, some phasing. In many, in other areas of the state, uh, the, the, uh, it required some further work because again, you didn't have that same level of detail. You maybe the planning partners in that area maybe hadn't spent uh, the same amount of time prioritizing. And so that's where our CDOT region staff really spent some time uh, over the summer months and, and working with planning partners, largely in our rural TPRs, to further define those uh, project priorities and to further prioritize. So what, what exactly does it include? What are those 130 or so projects or, or 70 in the 10-year uh, the, uh, development program plan? Uh, what are those? Um, as I mentioned, they are highway projects at this point. Um, we, we do have uh, a, a good amount of transit information in there, but we're, we're still developing it. We're still vetting it. We haven't really incorporated bike ped yet other than to the extent that bike ped elements exist in highway projects that are included. Um, it is by no means every project. It is uh, major, and we did not define major as a certain dollar amount. It, it was really... So, and, and the reason for that is that major is kind of means something different in different parts of the state. Um, what would be major to, uh, uh, we might consider major in the Dr. Cog area uh, is quite a bit different in Region 5 in Southwest Colorado. And so I think the, the common thread around that, and there's a little bit of a homegrown definition here, is that we were looking at projects that had an unmet funding need and that really were things that were significant enough to their area that that they were, they were generally considered a major priority in that, that area of the state. And they also would lar likely require additional funding sources to, uh, to complete. So they weren't things that we could just likely complete in the next 10 years with, um, if, by funding it with STP Metro and surface treatment funds, for example. It's something that would, would need something really to substantially complete, whether it was um, some Senate Bill 228 revenue, a Tiger grant, um, some new funding source to really kind of complete the project. So two other points I want to make on, on um, again, on, on what it doesn't include. Uh, it only includes projects that would be funded with revenues flowing through CDOT, and only if sufficient revenues were available. So again, this is kind of, uh, this is not uh, funding we have today, it's unmet funding needs. It does not include projects that we anticipate uh, to be funded primarily with local or regional funds. So if you were to look at your Dr. Cog plan, you're not going to see in our development program 
uh, projects that are in there as 100% locally funded or primarily locally funded or primarily Dr. Cog funded. These are really, again, projects that are likely to be funded uh, in large part uh, or primarily or, or in whole uh, with CDOT revenues. And then as I mentioned again, um, this, is, this is even at nine and a half billion, it's really just a, uh, a small, a, a portion of our unmet funding needs because we are leaving out and we're reminded this uh, a lot from our, our uh, planning partners and our region staff that uh, many of the, the priorities throughout the state that we don't have enough money to fund today are not big projects. There are a lot of smaller projects out there that we're not capturing here that we, we also don't have the funding to complete today. So it's just a partial picture of that significant unmet funding need. So just kind of wrapping up, um, where are we at and where are we going? Uh, we are in the process now, what I'll, I'll say finalizing that 10-year development program uh, plan and that really it involves um, uh, kind of doing some final uh, refinement of data, filling in some gaps on the data. Um, it's, it's largely complete. Uh, that being said, uh, it's something that we're looking to maintain and update in the future. So uh, I kind of just uh, articulated earlier that there was a larger inventory in the smaller plan. We're looking to uh, maintain the data on all this, these projects, uh, maintain that inventory so that we have um, current, uh, uh, relatively current cost information, uh, scope, et cetera. Um, but similar to you do with your RTP or, or TIP, we, on the 10-year pr uh, program plan, we don't want to constantly be shuffling things around and, and creating new versions. So what we're looking to do is probably to uh, put that on a, uh, an update cycle, and it would probably be at least uh, annually, possibly more frequently, but where we would, uh, we would at least once a, once a year come back to that plan, uh, revisit it, update it if things have been completed, if uh, priorities have changed, uh, provide an opportunity to solicit additional input and, and make adjustments to that. The, uh, the other point I'll make is that uh, we're, as we finalize this, we're, we're also looking to use it to support uh, additional project selection activities. And so we, um, we're doing that uh, already today. We have a new um, formula freight program that was created under the FAST Act. And so we've used this 10-year uh, this development program plan as a, a foundational element in that process. So we worked with our CDOT regions to look at that 10-year development program plan, identify what were the projects that fit, fit the criteria of that program, that fit the characteristics of that freight funding source, and then we're now in the process of evaluating, looking at those projects and trying to develop a, a multi-year uh, program of freight projects. So, uh, so again, this will also be a tool that we'll use uh, as we look in the future for future rounds of discretionary grants. What are, you know, what are kind of highest priorities across the state for a Tiger program, a fast lane program, uh, et cetera. So that's um, that's kind of the high level overview. Um, I'm happy to uh, to answer uh, any questions. Thanks, Jeff. Director Shockey. I'm curious. So so it seems like a huge task, I guess we're somewhat familiar with, to prioritize all the projects. And so I understand in some cases you go back to the plans, um, like in where there's less plans or where you're checking things, what data do you go back to and how do you, how do you prioritize the projects based on that data? Sure. So at what you see in the development program, the two and a half billion, um, is not prioritized beyond that. There's no rank order or kind of a, at, at this point, there's no rank order, there's no kind of tier one, two, or three. Um, the, the prioritization that's happened at this point was basically to say out of that nine billion, you know, what's, we're gonna kind of constrain down the, the higher priority uh, projects or phases to, to meet a two and a half billion dollar target. And that number is somewhat arbitrary. We, we just set it as a, as a target to try to uh, constrain to. And at, at this point, what, that was driven largely by uh, the planning process and planning partner input. It did not involve a technical evaluation of projects or scoring of projects. Uh, it was simply, again, a, largely a reflection of uh, what was already articulated by partners and known to be kind of the higher priorities within a particular area of the state. 
Uh, as I mentioned, I think it also reflects not only priority, but to some extent uh, there's an element of readiness and phasing and just the sense that there are, there are some, some projects that, uh, that are included in our 10-year component because um, they're, they're likely to be ready or, or, or should be completed prior to other program projects that are maybe a higher priority but are, are staged a little further out. And, and then when you look at the regional plans, which plan are you looking at? Are you looking at the financially constrained plan or the TIP or the, not the TIP? So we, we're, we looked um, at the regional transportation plans for the most part, um, also project lists because we do have, uh, is, uh, as the chair mentioned, there's been over a period of years a multiple project lists that uh, um, particularly in areas of the state that don't have projects detailed in their plan those project lists provided a good kind of inventory of, uh, of those projects. But primarily the regional transportation plans, um, in, in the case of the Dr. Cog area, what you'll see is that uh, most all of the projects that are, are assumed to be primarily funded through CDOT revenues are in that inventory. And uh, in that 10-year development program plan, you, uh, you should see the projects that are articulated in your plan um, in the uh, the first ten year uh, band uh, of your RTP, and I think you correct me if I'm wrong, Doug, but you have three three time bands in your RTP. Correct. So 2015 to 2024 and 25, 35, and 35 to 40. Thanks, um, Director Malay, and then Director Shenanik. So. At one point, you indicated that this is a tool, not a project priority list, but then you kind of seem to be floating a little bit back and forth with that terminology. Mm -hmm. So can you, can you articulate a little bit more on that? Like, so it's a tool, but you also speak about establishing priorities. So if you are establishing right. priorities and they're based on planning partner input, who are those planning partners? Is it just the RTP documents or what, what other information? Sure. Could you elaborate? So the, so let me, let me start with the high level and then I'll, I'll kind of zoom in on Dr. Cog. Um, at the high level, yes, it has established priorities in the sense that we've, we've tried to capture kind of what we know today to be uh, um, pre previously demonstrated as a priority. That being said, so I think the, that two and a half year billion dollar is, uh, is, a, is a starting point for us. And I'll, I'll give you a concrete example. When we're, we're working on the freight program right now, uh, we, we started by looking at everything that was in that 10-year development program, or having uh, regions look at what was in that 10-year development program and review for um, what projects fit within the freight program. But we also said, um, what else? Are there other projects either that aren't in here because uh, we, you know, we somehow should have captured them and didn't, they, they are a priority and we should have captured them, or there's, there's instances, uh, plenty of instances, as I mentioned, smaller projects aren't captured here. So when I say it, it provides a foundation, I think is a good way to describe it, but it is, it's not binding. There's no, uh, there's no requirement that says if, uh, if uh, a project is going to be considered in a process that we have to go through some amendment action to put it in here. It's, uh, it's just a starting point. Director Shenanik. In, in, is it oh. Jeff? Yes. Okay, Jeff. Um, let, let me try and put it in, in uh, my terms a little bit. Um, it, it sounds like uh, that in the past what happened is uh, some money comes from somewhere and uh, it has certain restrictions upon it and uh, somebody puts together a spreadsheet of the projects. Uh, what you're looking to do is have a, an existing spreadsheet already there and we're kind of like playing Tetris. <laughs> which is uh, some dollars come in that have some uh, constraints upon them or restrictions upon them and because we're having an advanced look of what's coming down the road being prioritized out of the regions uh, there's a chance to actually take a look at uh, how does this Tetris piece that comes from the wild blue uh, fit and we can best optimize this for Colorado. I think that's a, a very good way to put it. Um, the you know and, and and I'll also say that this is this is the first time we've developed anything like this, um, and so it 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 continues to evolve I think and and as we we move into the next long range planning cycle I think we'll be looking at how do we kind of incorporate this tie this better into the development of the plans, um, 
But uh, one of the things that uh, we're also doing is we're, we're, we're having discussions with our Transportation Commission about kind of their thoughts on how do we use this. And, um, you know, is there, right now I'm, I've, I've described it as basically um, a, a, you know, the larger inventory and the smaller subset. Um, there's, there's been back and forth discussion at our commission about, uh, um, you know, how do we use this? Do we, do we stop where we're at here and maintain it and we say this is a great tool, we can, you know, kind of pull it out and, and, uh, and use it um, just as you described? Or do we, uh, do we want to take it a further step? Do we want to go through some additional uh, uh, prioritization, uh, what, whatever that looks like? Um, and, and so we're, we're having those discussions with our, our commission right now to kind of see where that goes. So, uh, you know, my, I'll, I'll add to my comment, which is uh, it's kind of an interesting Tetris game because there's other dollars that flow into the MTPs that uh, they, they are deploying. So it's, not, it's a little bit of a three-dimensional Tetris in going through this. And at least, <laughs> uh, in, uh, at least the anxiety would be that uh, it gets taken too far by the commissioners uh, that moves the regions out of that process. And so uh, yeah, I, I would, I, it sounds like from my perspective, uh, there's a very um, interesting balancing point mm -hmm. between uh, how far the commissioners may want to go in this versus uh, what the regions might feel is uh, some anxiety of taking away some local control. No, I think that's, I think that's well put. Uh, I think, and, and that's why what we have done in developing this is uh, was a, a region driven process so uh, there was no you know there was no uh, statewide evaluation or or, or centralized process to uh, identify either the priorities themselves or I mean either the inventory themselves or the priorities um, that was driven uh, within each region by the staff in that region uh, working with the the partners in uh, their area and, and uh, uh, I, I believe actually I didn't an answer completely a previous question, which was kind of I think you'd made the point who who are the the partners and um, in the in in uh, our tr rural transportation planning regions, uh, those are our regional planning commissions, which uh, tend to be a combination of city and county staff and elected officials that uh, that meet with the CDOT region staff. Uh, in the case of, of Dr. Cog, you all are our planning partners, as are your staff. And so uh, CDOT Region 1 and Region 4, in both kind of doing the inventory as well as trying to vet uh, uh, what was, what's in that 10-year development program plan, uh, did that uh, it, through meetings with, uh, with counties, through I think both the county hearings as well as regular county meetings. Um, there, in the case of Region 4, they took it to, uh, to some joint um, regional planning meetings. Uh, and uh, I think both regions also uh, brought forward the 10-year the development program plan projects to the TAC, I believe, in a couple of months ago, August maybe? So. And uh, my, my uh, one last question okay. actually goes to the chair. Um, oh. <laughs> at least since uh, you invited Jeff to come and address us, are we missing anything that you thought we should know? No, I don't think so. I, I, I think the main thing was to make sure everybody knew that this process was going on and also send a signal to Jeff that Dr. Co the Dr. Cog board is interested in being a part of this process going forward, particularly if this is used for project selection in any of the various forms that are coming up. So. Yeah, and I, 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 appreciate, uh, I appreciate you having us. Um, I'd also like to point out that we, you know, we, we, uh, we appreciate your input. We'd like to get your input in this, um, and that's really what we're we're trying to do at this point is not so much to, uh, to to prioritize, but to try to capture what we think is out there today in terms of priorities. So, uh, the region staff, like I said, are, are working uh, uh, in many cases with your staff and with Dr. Cog's staff, and uh, and so we, you know, we we welcome input. We again on that ten-year development program plan. We're, we we want to kind of put a a, uh, a little bit of a, a stamp on it, at least for a, a short period of time, or we'd be changing it uh, constantly. Um, but that being said, I think we'll be looking to continuously collect input on it so that as we update it, we can uh, reflect uh, changes in, uh, in priority. I think Director Shakti had another 
question. Um, so, so the way I understand it, the, am I right, the RTP is mostly what jurisdictions say they prioritized? Uh, correct. Oh, between now and the year 2040, yes. Yeah, okay. And so basically you're compiling what the jurisdictions say they prioritize. Um, and then before the funding process, there's a process of the state deciding what they think is a good project? Is that right? So when, when you go through the process of developing your regional transportation plan, um, so you did that for your fiscally constrained plan and what adopted that a year or so ago? Yeah. Um, when, when we go through that pro process, generally the way that works is your plan it has, uh, it has projects that are, pri again, primarily funded with CDOT uh, controlled revenue uh, pro and projects that are primarily funded with Dr. Cog directed revenue. Uh, Dr. Cog's staff uh, conducts uh, a, you know, a, a working with all of you, conducts a, uh, a, a rigorous evaluation process to determine what those, uh, what those uh, projects are that are, are anticipated to be funded with regionally directed funds. The, C the CDOT regions, um, uh, regions one and four, work through the planning process, work through the county hearing process, uh, get input from all of the jurisdictions, and use that to identify what we think uh, are likely to be, again, those priorities at staged over that 20-year time frame. And then that is what is, uh, is put forth in your regional transportation plan and then vetted through the committee and board process where, again, those you all have and your, your individual uh, jurisdictions have the ability uh, to provide us feedback on, on whether you think those are the right uh, priorities. So does CDOT, CDOT look at the data about the individual projects to see what would be a good project in CDOT's eyes? Yes, I think that that's uh, uh, very much the case when it comes to the regional transportation plan. Uh, there is not a, a, you know, a single scoring metric that we're using today. It's, uh, it's, it's a, a really a combination of factors uh, that, uh, that the region uh, balances based upon available funding, based upon the merits of the project, and based upon stakeholder uh, input. Thank you. Director Mulligan, sorry I missed you earlier, and then Director Fanganello. You're fine. Thank you for coming today. Um, a question I have is $2.5 billion and, and $9 billion overall is a significant amount of money, and I know CDOT has, uh, is piloting a pay-for-mile um, program right now, and there's issues with the gas tax. And so I'm curious what CDOT's plan is to come up with some revenue sources uh, for these projects. Sure. Great, great question. Um, yes, you referenced our... Uh, a road user charge pilot um, that that is a research project we're conducting right now um, that that's uh, really a, a technical study at this point looking at the you know the the functional viability of a, a road user charge um, I think that uh, that uh, you know long term I think it's the we we recognize that most of what's in that uh, uh, ten-year development program plan are things that uh, either we will not be able to complete in the in the absence of additional funding, or um, or we will be able to chip away a little bit at a time. Uh, certainly, there's there are things in there we'll be able to complete in their entirety, but to really you know to really advance that that full program of projects, it's largely unfunded at this point. And so I think that um, you know I I I don't have the the answer to the the funding uh, question, but I think that uh, one thing that the uh, ten year development program and the broader inventory helps us do uh, better, I think, is articulate and demonstrate what some of the major unfunded um, needs are, and also, I think, help, helps better to demonstrate um, what we might be able to do uh, with additional revenue. Director Fanganello. Yeah, thanks again for coming. This is good information. I had a couple of questions. Um, are the dollar amounts that you guys are showing, or is this for planning, implementation, or both? I would say it's for planning at this point, and, um, and I'll, I'll look to Dan as well, because a lot of this information for Region 1, uh, again, I'll, I'll defer to the region. So um, with the Chair's permission, if Dan has uh, anything sure. to add, please hop in. But uh, I, I think you, what you have there is a combination of, depending on the maturity of the project, from somewhat of a sketch level to more detailed uh, 
uh, cost estimates, but this is a planning tool. Okay. So I think um, I, I know that's that's uh, I, I think a bit of a, a caution that we use when when looking at those numbers uh, to to recognize that they they are uh, many of them kind of sketch level estimates. And Dan, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, thank you, Danny Herman, Region One Planning Program Manager. I, I would just reiterate what Jeff said. They're they're very high level. In some cases, we have much better estimates. Some of the studies are pre-study, not even PEL. Some of them were out of PEL. Some of them they're done with the EA. We have a much better idea. Um, and to, to kind of go off of what Director Cernanek said, my big fear is that somebody gets a hold of it and says, oh, well, if you give me $90 million, I can deliver this. Well, $90 million was our planning level estimate when we started this. That doesn't mean we can. So that's the message we try and deliver back. Uh, we already know some of these are changing. One of the things we have to avoid is, uh, as you know, with NEPA, we can't predetermine an outcome. So sometimes we set out and we say, well, we want to get this on the list, so let's look at the most cost-effective outcome and put that dollar amount on here. Once we know what it is, it may end up growing. So there's a lot of factors that go in, but these are usually pretty high-level estimates, um, some of them a little bit more firm, defend, you know, depending on how far they've been studied. Sounds good. Um, and then you mentioned earlier that, that there's some formula freight dollars that are coming into the state. Do you have an idea of how much those dollars are and what yes. kinds of things are eligible? And so the the formula freight program uh, is new under the FAST Act last December. It provides uh, between about 15 and 16 million a year uh, federal to Colorado. And so uh, we, and beginning next December, there is a requirement that uh, that as of next December, uh, the, uh, you, the how you're going to spend those formula funds ha has to be uh, documented in a freight investment plan, part of a state uh, freight plan. So we're actually uh, we're kind of doing two parallel processes, and that is that uh, recognizing that the first year of that program is fiscal year 16, uh, we want to get some dollars out the door more quickly. So we're doing uh, a project selection process right now, looking at uh, how we. Uh, use those funds for the first two to three years of that program. In tandem with that, we are in the process of developing a new uh, multimodal freight plan and state freight and passenger rail plan, which is about a, uh, a, a year-long effort. And uh, through that process, which includes, uh, uh, in fact, we had a, had a, a meeting um, of our, our advisory committee uh, on that plan this afternoon, um, that, that that is uh, that plan is being developed with our stack, with our freight advisory council, uh, with uh, uh, MPOs uh, participating, and that uh, plan will uh, articulate the the uh, uh, freight priorities for the uh, next several years of the uh, of the program. Is that uh, that? You mentioned the project selection process. Is that something you guys are doing internally, or is that some, it's a solicitation out to the community? Um, it is not a solicitation. Right now, the, um, we are doing internally a evaluation process. So each region is uh, essentially looking at uh, uh, the, the projects, the needs within their area that meet um, the uh, uh, freight eligibility criteria set up for the program. And so we're, we're actually uh, going through that process right now, we're going to be bringing back together the results of that evaluation and bringing forward uh, to stack and to our freight advisory council uh, some uh, recommendations for uh, for how we use that for the uh, first two years of the program. And we're looking to be doing that probably in January. That we'll have uh, have that out to uh, to solicit comment on. Great, thank you. Other questions? All right. Thanks, Jeff. We really appreciate you coming here tonight. Happy to do it. Thanks. Next, we have um, a discussion on providing comments on the draft Metro Vision Plan. And I think Brad is going to lead us through that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, I guess. Good afternoon. I think we're maybe in between. That it's dark outside, so I'll go with... Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Brad Calvert. I'm the director of the Regional Planning and Development uh, Group here at Dr. Cog. Um, and I'm just largely kind of going to hit some highlights that are in, in the memo. This is attachment F, and I hope, hope it does a pretty good job of laying out what, what lays ahead of you. But I wanted to sort of 
talk a little bit about that mostly so that you can hit the ground running in January. So that's really sort of my motivation for being here uh, this evening. Um, for those that have really been um, uh, deeply entrenched in the conversation to develop the new and revised Metro Vision plan, for the past maybe six months or so, we had circled actually this board meeting as, as potentially the time that we would, uh, you would consider uh, uh, taking action on the plan. Uh, but as was mentioned in November, when we had both a public hearing and kind of an overview of the plan process, we actually received a significant number uh, of comments during that public comment period. Um, and with the really short turnaround, obviously this meeting's been moved up two weeks to be respectful of those comments and to give really some staff at Dr. Cog some time to put those together together for you in a way that's hopefully helpful. It really made more sense to think about uh, January is the time frame to, to really um, pick up uh, the conversation again. Um, as outlined in the memo, we actually received about 25 uh, sets of comments, um, which if you actually add up all the individual comments, gets close to like 300 kind of light item comments, about half of those um, coming from uh, your jurisdictions. Uh, and so we really obviously want to be respectful of those. And so I really just kind of wanted to give you sort of a preview of how this information is going to be packaged and bundled for you um, because the board will be picking up this conversation, as I mentioned, at your um, January work session um, on the 4th. Uh, so mostly so you're not confused when you see the packet because it may be feel like it's duplicative or overwhelming, but it's you'll hopefully you'll see the sort of um, the method to the madness here. Um, so much as we did in November um, in January, you will see every uh, set a comment um, from the original commenter, right? So if I receive a comment letter from Jurisdiction X, you will receive that letter as it came in uh, uh, to Dr. Cog. Um, that, that's sort of a given. Um, the other thing that you're going to see is we will then take each of those comment letters and almost pull them apart and take individual comments and bundle them by issue or topic, right? So that you can make sense of how you might be seeing different comments coming in from different jurisdictions or different stakeholders on a, on a similar topic. So one easy way to think of that that we will certainly do is the, 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 plan, the plan is um, sort of organized around uh, five overarching themes. Uh, we, we receive comments that to me could be assigned uh, to each of those themes, but we also received, you know, in some content we got more comments, and so we'll sort of piece those out for you so that you can see them separately. So, for instance, we got a lot of comments on urban growth boundary, urban growth area. We received quite a few comments on performance measures. So we'll, we'll sort of strip those individual comments out and sort of bundle them by, by topic as well. I think the last time I looked, we probably had maybe 12 to 15 disc discrete topics uh, that you'll see um, comments by. And as noted in the memo, uh, really staff's job is to then take those comments and give you sort of a high-level staff feedback on those comments so that just something that you can take into consideration as you are um, uh, making a decision as to whether that comment should be um, ultimately reflected in an updated version um, of the draft plan. And then, uh, as also noted in the memo, we will also – uh, staff will make suggestions based on the feedback that we received about um, suggestions that we are supportive of and, and to us makes sense to go ahead and um, include in that draft uh, that the board would, would ultimately um, take action on. So that's generally how we're approaching it. I'm happy to sort of take questions on that or if you think that's a terrible idea, now is a perfect time um, to tell us uh, you don't like that idea. Um, the other thing that I would mention that's also um, noted um, in the memo is that one of the things, because we did receive so many comments from jurisdictions, uh, we've extended an invitation to any jurisdiction that submitted comments uh, to meet with Dr. Cog's staff to talk through uh, comments that were submitted, um, largely almost to sort of for me and Doug in particular to sort of get a sense of context, context maybe ask some clarifying questions just to help us understand maybe what, what the sort of, um, uh, sort of the genesis of the comment was and to really kind of help us understand how we might ultimately uh, maybe roll that comment into a, a staff suggestion uh, for an amendment for the plan. So I just wanted to let you know that that is happening. Um, if your jurisdiction did submit comments, that, that invitation has gone out. Um, I was actually out um, in Aurora this afternoon, and we've got another uh, five or six uh, scheduled over the coming weeks, and we're very hopeful to have those done. Um, in the next maybe 10 days to two weeks so that, again, when you see sort of a summary of, of comments um, and potential feedback from staff in January, we will have had uh, those conversations. So that's really it for, for me in terms of um, providing an overview. Happy to have a conversation or a discussion or answer questions. 
I'm going to start with a couple of questions for me. One, are you going to provide um, red line recommendations for edits at the January work session? Yes. So the way, I mean, we'll sort of work through format, but we will we anticipate, presuming that, that staff will have some suggestions to, um, to revise the plan, when, when, when the board sees, uh, has the conversation on the 4th at the work session, we will produce a red line version of a draft that, that includes um, those suggestions that obviously came through the comment process, staff is supportive of, and we will then obviously create a red line version for um, the board to consider. And for jurisdictions, say mine, which didn't uh, submit additional written comments under the theory that the year and a half um, uh, set of meetings where I was vocally advocating with my comments provided that are though how do you weigh uh, are you uh, providing the same weight for all of the comments you re you've received prior to the written comment period I'm just worried about we've been working on this for a year and a half and now we're going to make changes in the last session that could be counter to the year and a half's work, how do we balance that out and what is that going to look like? It's going to be balanced at first through probably my brain and Doug's brain. Um, and I will tell you, we've talked about this a little bit and reflecting on just, yeah, I know it's a dangerous proposition, right? <laughs> um, you know, in the two meetings that I've had with member jurisdictions that did submit comments, I, mean, I, I said something along those lines. It's like recognize that the, that the board spent at minimum 16 months thinking about nearly every single word that, that appears in the, in the draft plan, right? So um, we are going to just have to be really thoughtful about how we ultimately take comments that came in, to your point, during um, the comment period and how that um, should potentially be reflected um, in the draft. And so we, you know, I, I don't think we've really started that process of me the mental uh, sort of juggling of getting to a point where we can make those determinations. A lot of a lot of it is riding on these these um, uh, meetings with with local staff just to kind of get a sense of things. Um, you know, because the comments varied. We got comments that were very specific. Insert these five words, uh, which you know, on on its face, you know, makes sense to pretty big um, uh, conversations. So that's our challenge in the next two weeks is to is to weigh what you just talked about, the amount of time, attention, and effort that, that this group spent um, over a year and a half with really kind of um, uh, obviously what came in during the comment period. Uh, you know, in some ways we are serving as a temporary arbiter of that, but you obviously are the, the final arbiter as to what um, should be included in the, in the draft plan. Thanks. Additional qu questions? I see Director Cernanek and then Director Brockett. Well, good. Um, thanks for that overview. I, it sounds like you guys are absolutely on track, and I appreciate the thoughtful approach that you're taking. But, but just to uh, Director Jones' point, just um, I just urge you with your recommended changes to you know err on the side of taking the the work that this body has done over the last year and a half as a starting point, and and recommend changes uh, only a very moderate number. So, just comment. That's good to hear. Uh, and Brad, I know we talked about this at the board retreat. Um, recognizing that the Dr. Cog board <clears throat> is not doing all the lifting to execute the 2040 plan, um, what's being done to ensure that economic development organizations or housing organizations uh, for which there are components in the plan that um, they're going to be doing at least a, a, a more of the heavy lifting in some areas, um, that indeed their fingerprints aren't lost from when we had our subcommittee discussions with them uh, to the final document. Sure, I mean, you know, part of that is, you know, they, to your point, um, many of our partners were involved during what I would call the plan development phase. Um, from during the sort of comment period phase, we did not necessarily hear from a, a, a lot of what I would just call it sort of our regional partners. Um, we heard from RTD and, and some other folks. Um, in some ways, I think, the big lift is is after we have a we have a plan that this board adopts that we know what's in it, right? I mean that's the thing. I mean I've probably described to this group. I don't consider the MetroVision plan the Dr. Cog work program, but it certainly influences our work program to some degree. And to your point, also we hope influences the work program of many partners that are more, you know, maybe have topics that are more germane um, to what they work on. But I've got to have a plan to really begin those conversations of how we coalesce around ideas. I, although I, what I might suggest is at least a, a communication with some of those significant groups 
uh, to just say, hey, uh, we're finishing off the comment period. Um, you've been busy while we've been busy. Um, maybe you might want to take a look at it as it's getting very close uh, to the end of the comment period uh, to reach out to those because uh, I'm, you know, we as we went through some of those subcommittee discussions, we said. Uh, Dr. Cog is not responsible for some of this. And so when it got to performance measures, performance measures are for the region, not necessarily for Dr. Cog's implementation. Director Malay. Um, as uh, I just want to speak to some of the communities who did submit comments. And while I certainly was an active participant in the development and preparation of the plan, when my staff, who are the experts, <laughs> reviewed the plan and it is their job to actually identify potential unintended consequences or implications to my community from adoption of the plan and I think I can only speculate that one of the reasons you heard from over half the comments being from member agencies is, was the due diligence of our respective staff so in the sense that of course we the policy direction was established by the board there will potentially be instances where some changes I might be advocating, I, and I don't know, I, I may be advocating for some changes if um, I think the ramifications to my community are, are going to be, uh, or region, frankly, not just my community, or challenging. And so I, I would re just want to reserve that right. Um, not expecting it, but I do think that that's important. We, just because we've worked on it for a year and a half does not mean we need to rush through adoption if there's issues raised by our staffs that need to be debated. And I know you're going to comment. I was just laughing at rushing. Uh, as if any part of this process could be accused of that, but no. Hey, birthing a baby takes time. <laughs> <You're> <laughs> You're <laughs> it's time to induce here, I people. I didn't specify a species. Didn't specify a species. Did not, did not specify a species. Uh, other comments, Sersha? Did you have your no? Uh, Doug. I, I, I might just add that, you know, once, as Brad suggested, you know, we will be doing an initial review of this and seeing where, where um, you know, possible recommended, recommended changes may occur, that, you know, we'll, we'll be, we're cognizant certainly of the board's intent, right, of when, when they developed this document over the last year and a half or so. Um, but there, there could be opportunities, you know, to, to, to um, there, where there could be revisions and still maintain, revisions of words and still maintain the intent. So that's, that's the one thing that I think we'll be looking at as a threshold if, for us to make a recommendation or not. And I, and I will just add, understand, it's, and I, maybe this is not what you want to hear, but this plan uh, can be amended. Um, and so, you know, where we get, um, when we induce, may, does not necessarily mean that's the thing that, that, that lives on forever. There are, we, you know, we constantly anticipate that there will be conversations around is is the plan that exists at whatever point in time still the plan that's right for this region so I just recognize that it's a continuous conversation are you warning us of post fact genetic engineering <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we do have one last comment from director chair there you go. Um, well I guess I want to say I guess I want to commend you for the transparency of the process so yes, some, some words might be adjusted a little bit and we might fine tune a little bit, but as I read what you described and heard what you described, it's a very transparent process. So we are blending things, but we're being transparent in that effort. So good for you. Well, and <laughs> I, well thank you. I would say, exactly, I would say good for, for, for this yeah, body. Yeah. Um, you know, I. You know, I, when you hear 300 comments came in, I think you get the impression that people are upset and angry and don't think something is right. That is not the case at all. I mean, every, I mean, I have, I can't tell you how many times in the past three weeks I've heard, "Love the plan. These are friendly suggestions." That that that's really honestly what we're what we're what we're hearing. Which to um, Director Brockett's point, I mean, I think we would be very judicious in the in the types of um, things that we would suggest maybe should be amended because. Even these background conversations have been, we can live with it just as it is, but have you thought about this, that, and the other that maybe adds a little bit of clarity? So, All right. Maybe that's a happy, hopeful note to end this conversation on. I, Please I, come on January I, That 14th. was what I was going to say. If you don't show up at the work session in, on January, 
I don't want to see you at the board meeting going, oh, yeah, I didn't, I, I wanted to, well, you know, show up at the work session, January 4th. Anticipate that that will be a long meeting, well run by my <laughs> trusty colleague, Director Roth, but uh, it'll be an important one. Well that, run. That's it. <laughs> okay, so that brings us to committee reports. Um, starting off with the stack, neither um, I nor uh, alternate Roger Partridge could make it to the stack meeting, so I'm making Doug Rex give that report. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Real quick, um, we had a, uh, several briefings. We had a briefing on the 10-year development program that you heard this evening. Um, we also got a briefing on the Fast, uh, Fast Lanes grant. And the Fast Lanes grant is a, is a discretionary grant program um, through, the, through, the, um, through the FAST Act. Uh, CDOT will be, uh, they've recommended uh, submitting three projects um, on, I guess, on their behalf. It's uh, US 285, Lamar Bypass, US 85 Centennial Highway Improvements, that's in Region 4, it just touches us. And uh, Truck Parking Information Management System uh, uh, Project, and these were all projects that they submitted previously that were not funded uh, in the first round of Fast, fast Lanes. And um, I think that's it. And uh, we also had a briefing, uh, Director Mullica mentioned this earlier, on the uh, Colorado Road Usage Charge Pilot Program. Um, it's still in its infancy, and, uh, but we did get a briefing on that. It's, uh, it's, it's, I think it was, there was some interesting discussion, and I think we're very interested to see how, um, how that pilot project uh, 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 continues. And uh, we had a little follow-up follow discussion on the stack workshop. We, we, uh, we have been having these annual workshops now for the last couple of years. Um, inviting the transportation commissioners to attend and I think we had a very great open dialogue at the workshop and this was just a follow-up we actually have a luncheon planned with the transportation commissioners in February the stack does in order to um, just tickle their brain a little bit to make sure that our communication is where it should be and that's it excellent thank you Doug um, director Atchison no Met report, no report. Um, uh, metro area county commissioners um, we did not meet in the last month but we have our big legislative or i think we're calling it a regional gathering on the 14th just coming right up so um hope to see at least some of you there and um i think that's it for us director shenanick uh we did not meet in the last month uh, as uh, uh director jayla was uh somehow distracted with a federal audit coming in and so uh, uh state, audit. state audit i know so state oh excuse me state audit so i'll, I'll get it right so it sounded more ominous with federal but you know that was, um and uh but and we do not meet in december but we do meet in january so great director shockey rec the the sip um, was approved by the state agency and so now it goes to the legislature. Um, we've started lobbying on the process for the next SIP. Uh, one of the aspects of that is um, there's some idea that the new rules might, there might be some new rules about drift, which is something we wanted, but they might only apply to border states, so we're saying that that doesn't make sense. Um, and in the meantime, sort of now Iraq is preparing for the, the next SIP process, starting that process, and that involves um, modeling, having different studies, having sort of, it, we're in more of the background stages of that. Um, one of which will be a fuel study, I know, and there's a number of other studies too. So. Thank you for that. And I believe Director Partridge is going to give the E-470 authority update. The uh, budget was presented, everything's going well. E-470 continues to uh, uh, break records on usage, so it's going very well that way. And the expansion, the $90 million expansion is ahead of schedule, the eight miles from Parker Road to Quincy Avenue. So things are going well. E-470. Oh, we didn't approve that yet. I know, I was going to say, no whispering. 
Is that it? Yes, that's okay. it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and finally, uh, Bill Van Meter, tell us about Fast Tracks. Fast Tracks. Okay, um, it's a brief. It's a brief. It's a brief update this evening. The RTD Fast Tracks Monitoring Committee did meet just last night. There were no action items. There were two update items uh, presented as status report on both the North Metro and the I-225 projects. And I open for questions if people have them, but don't really have much to report. Fair enough. All right. Um, any other final um, announcements from anybody? I'm only stalling slightly because we don't get to start our committee meetings before 6. So I see Director Montoya. Thank you, Chairwoman. Um, Adam Mikowski, who's our member for Thornton, has officially resigned this position. So uh, I think at the next board meeting, our staff will have that resolution put together. But just want to let you know that Adam Mikowski will no longer be here. And, and you will be. No. Uh, I'll remain the alternate, and our mayor is going to become the member now. OK. I should clarify that. Thanks. Thanks. Director Pfeiffer. I just want to uh, recognize RTD uh, and their last meeting. Um, we had, since the gold line is uh, delayed, um, the RTD board voted in uh, extending, I believe it's the 55L, to uh, mimic what the commuter rail would be time wise and travel to Union Station. And it is not a small investment. So I appreciate uh, the gesture of the RTD board for our community. Also, because we also, our version of the A-Line, we like our A-Line better, um, which was ran by Shelley Cook, as many of you have known, um, shut down on October 26th-ish because of the RTD funding was supposed to stop and the gold line was supposed to come online. Well, that left, uh, she's had thousands of travelers to the airport uh, daily and um, we asked RTD in a very swift, believe it or not, I think less than a week, they made this decision to uh, uh, extend bus services from 5 a.m. to 10 p.m. hourly uh, express from our old town to the Union Station. So I don't know if you wanted to add, but I wanted to share my, uh, you know, it's not, we've not always been kind to RTD, and I know our, we expect a lot, but this was, <laughs> but this was at least a nice gesture, and I really, you know, out of the whole agenda, I was a little worried about staying there because uh, uh, I wanted to uh, just hear the conversation. Well, interesting enough, they didn't talk about anything, even their budget, until it got to this one subject, and they talked a lot about it and made me worried. But one, one theme that came out of it was they were really talking about regionalism and really talking about the, it's in their name as RTD. You know, the R does stand for regional. So... I like the fact that they were starting to think broader than them than their own communities, and and maybe it's a maybe they're it's we're leading the way in Dr. Cog to encourage regionalism, and maybe that will spread throughout the region. <laughs> Bill, you wanted to add on that? Yeah, um, thank you, Director Pfeiffer, for reminding me about that. It was good to see you that evening, and uh, just a quick update. It looks like don't hold me to it, but it looks like by the middle of this month, we should have that up and running. So, so I just want for people to know, that was less than a month from concept to implementation with approval, and it was a half million dollar investment. Are you trying to set higher expectations? <laughs> yeah. I'm just showing that this was a great example of, they recognized the need, they addressed it, they knew the, 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 it hurt us, and they, they fixed it, so. And one, one final note on that. We're going back and forth. Yeah, we're bouncing back and forth. The funding for that is being provided out of the savings, the operational savings that are not being expended but were planned to be expended for the actual G-Line operations. So that's in case people were wondering where that budget came from. So those of us on the Northwest Rail Line shouldn't be expecting you to provide advanced service? In one yeah, week. yeah, exactly. Rats. <laughs> Any other comments? Well, let me just uh, close by wishing everybody a happy holiday and uh, safe travels if you're going anywhere. And uh, 
Thanks for all coming together and thinking regional thoughts. Um, it's great to be a part of um, some unity and coming together because this, you know, it's been a trying year. So thank you all for your commitment to that.